this. I, I will just, I, I'm Ilana Varsha, I'm curator of, of the public program of Manifesta, and I would like to, to welcome you to, to the beginning of this for, uh, I guess, exciting, very urgent days of, of discussing about militancy and the issues put together by Jonathan Platt from Pittsburgh University, but somebody also who has been last year here in St. Petersburg and this, this conference came, uh, I guess, also from the moment of being here in those times and in last, politically, last, last half year and many discussions that raised around it. And uh, Jonathan will introduce all the amazing speakers uh, that we managed to invite uh, for those days. I just wanted to say that, you know, with the whole uh, political questions in the air and when uh, annexation of Crimea happened, there was this uh, there was this dilemma whether manifesta should stay or whether it should go and what actually should you know be our role in those times and uh, one of the things that, that then came up with many discussions was that maybe yes we we probably should try to stay but we cannot stay undisturbed so we cannot just stay as if nothing was happening that the, the, somehow the reason for staying became quite clear that only you stay if you refer to the situation, you stay if you refer, you are, if you are sensitive and, and responsive to what is happening geopolitically. And uh, mm, therefore I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that we managed to, to put in the short time this, this conference because it's one of the strongest uh, events of the public program problematizing exactly the questions of violence and of course in the last half year there is more violence than in the last years and militancy and um, mm, engagement and activism and relation between art and activism. So thank you very much again to all the speakers and, and for you to, to have come and uh, as you know today we are in Land Dog. Tomorrow we'll be in the lectorium in the general staff building. It's also important to discuss this issue in the core of the power uh, of art like Hermitage building and then we will be in Smolny. Uh, and I would like to, to thank also Artemi Magul for having contributed to the conference and being the partner in it, Professor at Smolnik. And on Sunday we will be going on a trip to, to Razlif, to hide the uh, hiding place of Lenin with the project of Vilya Orlov and for a concluding picnic and a, and a lecture of Ilya Budrajski is there. So welcome again and thank you very much. Jonathan, thank you very much too. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Please grab a headphone, set of headphones if you need it. Um, yeah, this, uh, this project uh, started about a year ago, um, last summer, over a year ago, uh, in collaboration with uh, Marietta uh, Bajovic from Yale University. We started thinking about this. She was working on a, uh, an article on the poet Kirill Medvedev, uh, who has a lot of, he'll, he'll be uh, reading, uh, we'll be discussing his works on Saturday. Uh, has a lot of images of, of revolutionary violence in his works, uh, and I was beginning a research project on Zoya Kazmodiansky, uh, who I like to think of as the last Soviet militant. Um, <laughs> yes, the last true militant, and very problematic, and we'll be thinking about that a bit um, on Saturday as well, uh, since uh, Glukia started making a film about me and my uh, my bizarre interest in Zoya that summer as well. But really, all year we were discussing themes uh, related to, to, to our topic. Uh, the Stodielet School for Engaged Art uh, was talking about violence their whole uh, first inaugural semester. Um, uh, and in, in general, it seems to, of course, with the increasingly worsening political situation, to become more and more of a pressing question. Um, so the main idea for, for our conference in some ways has already gone out of date. Uh, it was based in the summer of 2013 on this feeling that a new kind of consensus had emerged about uh, what kind of revolutionary politics uh, was most, in, most effective. Uh, and our feeling was that the consensus, consensus that peaceful mass protests uh, overthrowing some kind of tyrannical uh, regime, uh, uh, bringing not just democracy but often uh, economic, uh, liberal economic policies, was rooted in uh, what Artem Magun has called the negative revolution of 1989-91, uh, meaning the revolution against revolution itself, uh, the collapse of state socialism. Uh, 
uh, the sort of collapse of the second world as we used to know it. Uh, in those years was also the triumph of neoliberalism. Um, and since then, we've been seeing increasing repetitions of this kind of revolutionary model, which included a certain uh, feeling that violence is illegitimate in any form. Uh, and so our idea was that this uh, sense of a uh, delegitimization of violence was, could also be, was also reflected in aesthetic issues, particularly in the way that uh, the sort of original avant-garde idea of um, reducing, say, uh, an artistic medium to its foundations, uh, taking painting to its most uh, central uh, principles, in a sense destroying it in order to get to the, the power where it comes from, right? That that kind of model uh, is, is very similar to the model of revolutionary violence, this attempt to reach uh, some kind of place uh, from which power emerges, cons constituent power, as it's sometimes referred to. Um, and that in the 1980s and 1990s, you start to see no longer just a crisis of that kind of model, this model of, of, uh, of aesthetic negation, um, but a complete sort of uh, just moving away from it into, into other forms, forms that we might uh, call spectacular. The old enemy of, of the avant-garde is always the spectacle. Uh, you can see people saying, critique, artistic critique is dead, now we live in a world just of spectacle. But a lot of people maybe don't even uh, know that that opposition still exists. At the same time, you have uh, people making uh, very important arguments uh, and, and interesting arguments that uh, critique really is dead and for, and for a good reason. Uh, and that critique, the idea of artistic critique uh, is not just um, that it's, it's sort of revolutionary impetus actually hides a kind of hierarchical thinking. Uh, that the, uh, the sort of the avant-garde artist has to come and teach us, has to wake us up from our slumber, uh, uh, bring life back to us uh, that we've lost because uh, we sort of have succumbed to ideology and alienation uh, and the spectacle and so on. So our question was, what does militancy mean today uh, in that context? Now, of course, in the, in the, over the past year, this idea of a nonviolent consens consensus has completely fallen apart. And we've seen increasing use of state violence against protest movements. Uh, in our own context, we, of course, have a, a civil war uh, that's, that's broken out recently as, as a direct consequence of uh, a revolutionary uh, movement that started out peacefully but quickly turned violent. Um, and so a lot of these questions are, are evolving uh, uh, extremely rapidly. So what I was hoping that we would do today is, is discuss uh, with our, our guests here some of these issues um, um, and uh, see if, a lot of issues that probably don't have clear answers uh, at all, but in order to sort of uh, feel our way through where we stand. And I think the whole conference is really kind of about that, trying to, to think about uh, uh, to, to, to reflect on what, what the specific time we're in now is about and, and, and in what ways uh, we can uh, make use of the tradition, uh, the legacy of the past, uh, what ways we need to maybe cast it off. Uh, okay, so I, I want to introduce the, the speakers. Um, let's see, let's start with Katie. Katie Chukrov uh, teaches at the uh, Russian State University for the Humanities, at BGU, uh, and also works at the National Center for Contemporary Art. Uh, she's a philosopher, a poet, and an artist. Uh, she uh, has numerous publications, uh, including Pound and Pound, pound sign, Prosto um, Ljudi, Just People, Witi Ispalnyat, To Be and To Perform, uh, and many, many of you may have seen uh, her film, Love Machines, uh, which she showed here recently and debuted uh, at the first Bergen Assembly in 2013. Next, we have Gerald Browning, who teaches uh, at the uh, Zurich High School for Higher School of Art, I guess it would be in English, uh, and the European Institute for Progressive Cultural Policies. Uh, he's a coordinator of the transnational I EIPCP research projects, uh, a number of them uh, has um, uh, many books translated into uh, all the languages you can imagine, uh, in English including uh, Art and Revolution, uh, Art and Contemporary Critical Practice, 
A Thousand Machines, Critique of Creativity, and Factories of Knowledge, Industries of Creativity, most recently. Finally, there's so many participants in this conference. Uh, Jody Dean from Hobart and William Smith Colleges, Professor of Political Science. Uh, among her many books and edited anthologies are The Communist Horizon from 2012, uh, Blog Theory, Zizek's Politics, and uh, Empire's New Clothes, Reading Heart and Negri. Uh, Dean uh, Jody is also a member of the activist art collective Not an Alternative, based in Brooklyn. Uh, we're currently working on a, a, a series of projects that ask the questions, who is the contemporary radical? Okay. So, so maybe we could just start uh, with this question. I mean, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you guys think about this idea of some kind of original relationship between revolutionary violence and avant-garde. Uh, Aesthetics, um, and then moving through that, is it? Are we wrong to say that that was a kind of sequence uh, that's particular to the 20th century uh, that might have run out of steam finally, that no longer brings uh, brings uh, you know the same kind of effects that maybe it once did, um, or is it something that maybe should be we should we should be holding on to as much as possible because the alternative is not an alternative. <laughs> <laughs> say. Um, so, maybe, Katie. You didn't negotiate with the other participants. Maybe, well, you they, they, wouldn't, they would be willing to, to start up, but anyway. Um, well, um, it's really a, a very important issue whether we could refer to avant-garde politically and artistically. And, um, uh, we tend to think that avant-garde preserves its um, potentiality, both politically and artistically. Nevertheless, um, um, the latest developments, uh, both in the Institute of Contemporary Art and in the so-called engaged, um, socially engaged artistic practices, uh, shows that, um, on the one hand, the revolutionary aesthetics, the revolutionary intonations and motives uh, become more and more at form. So something that has ever been an engaged art um, destined to modify uh, the social space has acquired in the long run uh, a formalist uh, impact. Uh, and therefore, um, its uh, split with the so-called autonomous issue becomes less and less visible, less and less discrete. On the other hand, certain, um, well, you mentioned a revolutionary and violent uh, courage of avant-garde in transforming reality, right? But avant-garde, along with this um, ardent, uh, move uh, also had a very strong organizational, constructivist, and biopolitical programs. And uh, nowadays we can see that um, to a very considerable extent this biopolitical organizational legacy is appropriated by governmental strategies, by political technologies, by alternative businesses, by alternative economics, uh, so that uh, the biopolitical uh, um, revolutionary power of avant-garde and its um, uh, dissolution in life uh, becomes uh, the tool for the contemporary practices to, to, dissolve, to, to make capital creative and on the other hand to make uh, art simplistic and socially amorphous. So the situation is such that uh, uh, cognitive capital becomes more and more creative, more and more avant-garde, more and more subversive, whereas engaged practices, when they don't have political power, go, get aestheticized and um, are reduced to this exhibiting um, uh, context. 
therefore, for me, uh, in the latest five years, this would be a big question whether uh, all those poetics of the avant-garde um, legacy would uh, suffice today. Uh, and uh, whether we would have to either return to certain pre-modernist uh, aesthetics, which probably is the issue that we would discuss, or um, we would reside uh, and um, improvise within this uh, confusion between business, between capitalist economy and social engagement. Yeah, I, I very much agree with Katie uh, about the historical, uh, the, the fact that the historical avant-garde is historical, uh, and even the neo-avant-gardes are historical. I would uh, say, that, uh, would, um, say that the break that Katie put on the table with the word cognitive capitalism even happened uh, further ago, uh, meaning I would say, uh, you could say that in the, with the death of uh, the Situationist International uh, and uh, the Boer's legacy in the 60s, 70s, or in the 70s, not in the second 60s, uh, the death in the 70s, there uh, you could see a certain rupture concerning uh, the, even the neo-avant-garde becoming uh, historical. Uh, I, I, I don't want to um, cry so many tears about that. Uh, mm. This kind of machist uh, uh, leader, uh, uh, this, this machist um, practice in need of a leader, uh, is in a way uh, the same problematic that we could maybe discuss later uh, about the political or militant subject on the revolutionary level. Uh, but it starts uh, in, the, in the art field, it starts with this uh, same problem. Um, so uh, maybe let me uh, also say two things about the concept of both revolution and art, which seems to tend in your introduction more to a, for me, to homogenous, uh, both of them, to a homogenous uh, uh, um, figure. Uh, with the revolution, um, it's hard to, to, to do it very simply, but uh, one aspect, of course, is that or let's put it on the conceptual level. I would uh, um, guess that the problem is that so many revolutionary theories um, concentrated on a molar concept of revolution. And I would propose, the, uh, together with Felix Gattari, uh, I would propose the term molecular revolution here, uh, which is not only a kind of um, distribution and multiplication of the revolution on the social level, talk about the social composition here, for instance, uh, but also on the, on the time level. Uh, the idea, uh, the kind of sim sim simplified idea of a Leninist uh, uh, revolution, meaning, uh, Leninist concept of revolution, meaning that there is first uh, a bad situation in capitalism, then a big event in the universalist go a bit in the but UN direction of uh, uh, rupture, the great event, and then in paradise, uh, as I would say, ironically, uh, also concerning the socialist uh, developments of the Soviet Union. Uh, this is not real, it was never real, this idea of the three phases of revolution. It was always uh, a ming mingling situation of what I would call now a kind of uh, uh, differing a bit the terms of the three phases, resistance, insurrection and constituent power. From my point of view they are always together, there is no uh, timeline here. Um, and I would say even the, the Russian Revolution was something like that, mingling. Um, 
And on the other side, the art, um, the concept of art uh, as a homogenous block is even more uh, problematic. I would say there are a thousand machines that uh, are at work in the end between art and revolution or art and politics. Uh, even uh, to make it uh, a bit concrete, if I think about the friends of Stodella uh, who will um, present a new piece afterwards, uh, even Stodella as a group uh, is uh, many machines concerning these questions uh, between art and politics. Uh, so even on this uh, uh, now for the moment, even local level, we we have a, um, a myriad of uh, of machines that can't be put in a box with the question: What is the function of art and revolution? Thanks. Um, I want to think about the question primarily in terms of. Um, the problems of, of old and new, or um, you know, repetition and rupture, but really old and new. And I have kind of three thoughts about this. Um, one, terms like old and new are, are not very helpful. Um, in part because we always want to know, well, old or new with respect to what? Right? What's the context? Um, or new to whom? For, um, you know, for people who are um, older, um, it seems like we've seen everything before. Everything has a kind of, of um, rep a repetitious quality. Um, at the same time, capitalism demands perpetual novelty. So, and then in the fact that the novelty is perpetually demanded, and that reverses back into something being old again. So I think that, that to, to, to try to position questions of, of, of an avant-garde um, more broadly rather than just in, in art terms, but it's something that's going to bring forth the new or possibly new or be ahead of things is always a little um, challenging um, for me. So I think we should, the, the, the temporality um, matters here. Um, I also think that's, um, that the temporality matters um, with your initial um, positing of your project from 2013 with respect to the kind of that violence has become delegitimized, um, I would say that that had never been the case. Um, that in fact, the only thing that had happened was that the liberal capitalist state um, was able hegemonically to present itself as the only actor that could act in a way that um, was violent, but it even erased its own violence. So it's just, it seems strange to me to, to to hear in 2013 that you were thinking that um, that violence had become delegitimized or somehow outside of the range of politics, considering the U.S. war on terror was ongoing, right? I mean, violence was, uh, it never stopped. And so the question was, who, um, who claims the right to use violence? Um, under what conditions? Um, and I think that that substantial or substantive component of any discussion of violence is crucial. So um, I liked um, Kenny's point regarding the formalism of a particular version of the avant-garde. And I think that jettisoning, jettisoning that um, is, is crucial, right? I mean, violence for what substantial reasons? That I don't think we can um, raise questions of violence um, in, in the abstract. And I actually would, would say the same thing about constituent power. Right? What are people constituted? What are they making? Like constituent power by itself could be um, awful. Right? It could be constituting something that is completely fascist or racist or ethnocentric or nationalist. Um, that would fall out of this uh, uh, awful possibility potential. I don't understand. It would be the great other that oh. would not be appropriated. Oh, I would. I would say. Um, um, perhaps idealistically a communist possibility of emancipatory egalitarianism that was um, rooted in a, um, yeah, an egalitarian politics. And that would not be, that would be a different kind of, that would be a constituent power that goes in a different substantial direction. Um, I mean, in the, um, US, in the Anglo um, US tradition, 
Um, there's, um, our government is said to be part of a contract, right? a social contract, and governments apparently come out of contracts between people. Well, that's constituent power, right? That's just liberalism. And so I think that this kind of um, affection for constituent power is by itself a great thing is, is somehow just liberalism with another name. Um, one more thing, um, so, so I mentioned the point about the old and the new. I mean, the thing is with the current um, riots, protests, revolutions, I mean, this is different from what was um, the dominant, um, I would say, liberal left view of the 90s, which called everything post-political. I mean, now we're essentially seeing uh, um, the fact that politics was always there and violence was always there and can't be denied anymore. Um, I wanted to, um, I'm just going to make one more point, um, and that has to do with, um, I want to anchor this in, um, actually, in Alain Badu, um, from his discussion and theory of the subject. And this is, um, again, on, around this general theme of, of temporality or the time of the subject. And he says that the subject will have been. So its time is one of a kind of overlap of anticipation or haste. Right, the time is never right. And then the, react, the retroactive determination or reading of that rupture in terms of a kind of, of subjective process that it was part of. And I think that thinking about um, uh, militant politics or the politics of a subject always has to um, work around this gap, right, where there's the, the kind of, of um, uh, anticipatory move that's hasty, that's never right, but that can always be retroactively determined as something else, as something other. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I, I was going to comment and uh, a bit uh, defend uh, the point of Jonathan. I think when he claims violence, uh, he means exactly the a militant efficiency of, of, of uh, political investment of art and of the uh, creative in investment of politics into the social change. And militancy is meant as some kind of efficacy of, of, of the ardor and efficacy of uh, certain political passion. Uh, uh, which is not the case uh, for the contemporary rendering of uh, avant-garde or second avant-garde uh, legacies. Why? Because we don't have the political avant-garde. So the, the question would be whether capitalist economy would be the condition for deploying of avant-garde artistic strategies. And this was a point that was all the time reiterated by modernist uh, aestheticians and modernist uh, political theorists uh, in Berger's theory of avant-garde by Adorno uh, claiming that what avant-garde are we talking about in, in the complete uh, conditions of subsumption. Um, and, and therefore, contemporary theorists of avant-garde, and we know such theorists like John Roberts, for instance, who, who wrote and whose, whose book is going to be published recently, and who wrote proliferously about Stodzielets uh, and Stodzielets representation as being the contemporary option of avant-gardism, uh, he, uh, understanding this issue that uh, the capitalist economy cannot be the condi the capitalist life and its subsumed conditions cannot be the context for deploying avant-garde strategies. Th this is some kind of um, uh, illusion. Uh, he constructed this idea of second economy, claiming that artistic practices and um, social groups and alternative artistic communities are able to produce alternatively economic conditions where they produce counter-capitalist economic situation and due to this absolutely um, outskirts of capitalist economy which seem to be non-capitalist in some kind of alternative and undercurrent way, there is the option of avant-garde residing in this uh, second economy. So this is his point, which is regarded sometimes 
as a naive uh, manifests understanding that without political and economical uh, breakthrough, the aesthetic breakthrough would be um, an illusion. Yeah, I, I wasn't um, trying to say that violence stopped happening, <laughs> obviously. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's the old sort of Malcolm X or Martin Luther King kind of question that Martin Luther King kind of won that um, that debate. It seems in in a lot of in the hegemonic discourse, uh, obviously, um, and that even as uh, the, the war on terror began, and, and uh, I mean that's that's all part of this delegitimizing de process for me because if you try any kind of resistance, you're immediately labeled a terrorist. Um, and and but for me mostly it is about this 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 end of um, communism, kind of this this dream of the Velvet Revolution, uh, and they were even trying to to make that kind of. Uh, appearance in Iraq, you know, with the the people, the joyous children toppling the statue and so on. There are these kind of you get these kind of models that repeat themselves again and again of uh, just sort of people happily kind of entering um, freedom, where of course you know they're they're able to to be sold more things. Um, and so so that's really what I was talking about. But I think yes, that that uh, and that um, but that what what is happening now? I think definitely. Uh, that model is, is collapsing uh, in one way or another, and, it's, and to a large part it is because um, increasingly states are willing to use violence against their people, uh, which they, it seemed to be that wasn't, it wasn't working for a while. Um, although, of course, you know, we had the Chinese uh, version of 89 where, where violence was used to suppress the uh, uprising. Um, in any case, um, I think, uh, you know, this is really interesting, you know, to a large extent what we've, what we've uh, heard so far is, uh, is that the avant-garde, you know, is, is uh, in some ways responsible for, for capitalism. Uh, it didn't lose the battle with the spectacle, it just sort of uh, trans it kind of made it better um, in its own way. Uh, and, but, but I guess when we, when we come back to the question of what militancy could be today, I mean, for me, this, this, this heroic image of the avant-garde artist that, that, that Gerald, you were kind of saying, Maybe we should, there's other things going on. Of course, there are other things going on. Um, but that image had so much kind of, you know, it was inspiring for a lot of people for a long time, you have to admit. Um, and if it sort of has lost its, um, uh, its power its, uh, to, to inspire in that way or, or to, to have any kind of effect um, uh, in terms of its products, uh, it seems like it's important to, to, to think about. Um, and this question of the, of the subject, I think, is, is related to that too. Um, because of course, you know, in the, the, the idea of the revolutionary event, um, you're not supposed to just immediately enter paradise. The, the idea is that you're then, then you become a militant subject. You enter this collective subject, uh, the militant who has to proclaim the, the, uh, the truth of the event and so on, um, and, and work to, to bring it into to reality. Uh, and of course, this uh, brings us to, to some of the things Jody was saying about how that subject is always kind of too early or too late, and, uh, and, and the event itself is not something that, uh, that can be grasped and, and uh, uh, in the moment that it has to be uh, retroactive, retroactively determined. Um, so, and, and so, I mean, this is kind of what the second uh, topic I, I, I thought we could talk about is, is this, this idea of what the militant subject, how we should understand the militant subject if we still want that idea um, and how we should understand its its division because as we all know the subject is not integral it's not the Cartesian subject it's divided in, in one way or another um, and in maybe what would still be considered an old-fashioned kind of modernist idea of that militant division um, for me I, uh, uh, I um, the image that, that I really like is one that Sapka from Shlodiela uh, uses a lot, which is uh, from a, a, a Maxim Gorky short story of, of Danko. There's this guy who has to lead his uh, people from darkness, from a, from a dark forest where they're being uh, pursued by enemies, and, and when they kind of lose their, their hope, uh, he rips his heart out uh, and uses it as like a torch uh, to guide them through the darkness. And, then, uh, and so but this kind of image of, of, of someone really dividing himself in, into sort of, uh, there is, there is uh, this, this um, you know, I'm going to take, I'm going to take my, my divided uh, self, the sort of division between the power that I have and, and the sort of objective person that I am before you, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to just use that as, as, as uh, a way to, uh, to bring us to, to freedom. Um, but, but that is a kind of old-fashioned model in many ways. It is this kind of heroic 
uh, thing, uh, but I think it's one that comes up again and again in avant-garde avant -garde practice, and maybe it's, it's run out. Maybe in uh, cognitive capitalism, uh, communicative capitalism, we're divided in, in more molecular ways, uh, ways that make more, uh, you know, uh, that are much less sort of starkly visible like that in that image, um, and that that is what we have to deal with. And maybe there are, there are ways in which that situation is, is uh, both a new kind of oppression, but maybe also a new kind of resistance comes out of it. Um, so, that, so that's the next thing I, I wanted to, to ask, is if we think about militancy, uh, what, what do we mean by militant subject today? Uh, in what way, and, and, and what kind of division uh, of that subject is, is the one that, that uh, will be useful? Um, so, maybe Jody, or Jody. Um, so, uh, I want to first say how I understand um, division. Because um, uh, I, I emphasize division um, a lot when I write. And I'd, I'd like to, I think that it's important to emphasize a division when we're thinking about any kind of, of subjectivity. Um, and it essentially means that there's no such thing as a reconciled situation there, or a condition. There's no such thing as authenticity. There's no such thing as non-alienation. And that, that's a characteristic of, uh, of, of singularities, of collectivities. Um, actually, it's also a condition of objects. Um, but that, so, so, the, so division is not um, a, a kind of a characteristic that's dependent on our conditions under capitalism. Rather, it's, it's, it's condition of subjectivity as such. So that I want to be begin there and then say from the standpoint of thinking about uh, militancy today, I actually think that the figure of the militant is the crowd, right? That since um, um, Trevor Square, um, that we've seen massive crowds of people out there as, and that this, is, and it's, the, it's the fact of number impressing itself. And that that is so much more, um, like for us now, so much more inspiring than any kind of single person um, in the kind of macho leader way that you're describing. That in fact what has captured people's imagination from um, Tahrir Square on through the Occupy movement was the mass numbers of people in places. Now, there is a problem here. And that is no one knows what the politics of uh, any crowd is. Right? So the, crowd, the crowd's politics might be disruptive. It might be an interruption of, of um, the status quo of what's going on, but it can go in any direction. It can, become, it can be very right-wing. It can be actually um, just um, wanting more capitalist opportunities. Um, or it can have an emancipatory, egalitarian potential. And so I think that the figure of the militant is the crowd. And in fact, we see this even in um, individuated forms. Let's say the um, Guy Fox mask use, um, um, that Anonymous uses. That that is not a single person. Right? The idea that, it's that anyone can take that face. And so it's a standpoint for collectivity. I think um, for some in the US, one of the things that made Pussy Riot so exciting was also the balaclava that the, again, anyone can wear that. So it can be a standpoint for a whole multiplicity. Um, so I wanna, I, I wanna say that this, this crowd figure is the one to think about for contemporary militants. Yeah, there I agree. Um, but again, <laughs> the, the point is, I would say that your hopes in a communist egalitarian uh, situation are idealistic. Um, uh, it, it is um, definitely there is no hope for uh, a clear cut between uh, what I would call the machinic capitalist situation and some, something, something else. Uh, and this is also connected to, to, to the question of the subject. I, I think uh, we should uh, forget the, the concept of the subject. This is in the, in the direction of your question. Um, why? Uh, three arguments, um, and they are maybe a bit uh, con contingent, uh, just what came to my mind when I, when I read uh, Jonathan's question. Uh, one is the legacy of social struggles against the subject. 
in the utmost, for me, interest, utmost interesting uh, revolutionary situation. There is always uh, uh, a struggle against the homogeneous subject or even the divided subject uh, involved. Uh, like the um, nameless or anonymous uh, women um, of the Paris Commune defending the canons against the uh, uh, Versailles um, uh, army. Uh, they, they didn't uh, defend the canons because of a clear subject that was there. Uh, and the same goes for, uh, let's say, anarchists in the uh, early 20th century uh, for the anti-colonial struggles uh, around 1968, for the second feminist movement in the 70s, and so on, till the occupation. Uh, so there is a historical legacy of fighting uh, the concept of the subject within the utmost uh, radical movement. Second thing, contemporary modes of production. So this is rather a Marxist or post-Marxist uh, position. If to look at the technical composition of, uh, uh, of uh, or maybe it's in the third point then, uh, just referring to the contemporary modes of production. We're not living in an industrial capitalism, we're not living in a Fordist capitalism, we're not even living in a post-Fordist capitalism, I have to say. We're living in something I would call uh, individual machine capitalism. Um, so that means, uh, by the way, uh, thank you, Atiom, again for the whole work on the conference four years ago and the, and, and the book that uh, was uh, a trace for me that uh, I've just finished now these days a book on the individual and the individual is uh, um, um, something which is also not human and that there is another problem that I see with this uh, question of the crowd that you were focusing at I don't see the crowd as a humanist or uh, um, an assemblage um, Co connecting only humans, uh, it's, it's uh, more than humans involved there. And this is important and necessary because machine capitalism with, with its deriv derivatives, with the big data situation, with the log logistical aspects of capitalism, doesn't work on the human or individual or even collective level. It works on the individual level. That means that uh, it goes through us through us as individuals, but also through individual things. Uh, and if that is so, uh, one could discuss it, of course, uh, but if that, that is so, we also have to think, uh, as I said, uh, of the technical composition, um, um, also concerning the, considering the, the, the Marxist legacy of this question. And there, of course, to put it very simply, uh, we have a similar situation as uh, what Marx uh, um, famously uh, said about the, um, the word? Uh, small holding peasants, um, potatoes in a potato sack. That's our situation now, even more than uh, in the 19th century. Uh, uh, forget maybe the, the farmer's uh, logic there, but we're really working and living in a totally dispersed, deterritorialized situation. Uh, the mode of, that's by, why, by the way, I'm also very interested in the, in the Occupy movement as uh, crowds re-territorializing a certain situation in themselves. Um, Maybe one more aspect concerning the division question, because of course the terms division and individuality come from the same uh, uh, linguistic background. Uh, also, when you look at the legacy of the individual, the capitalist individual, uh, possessive individual, uh, it is a legacy of the individual which or who. Um, does something like self-division. Um, this is maybe also a Christian uh, aspect of uh, division. Um, and even your, um, your Gorky uh, example is an example of that. 
it's not uh, the individuality that crosses us, towards us, goes through us, but it's really the idea of the individual uh, uh, dividing himself and, and giving a part away. And this is Christian. This is Christian and then capitalist in this logic. Okay, I'm going to interrupt you for a second so I can respond directly. Um, Jared says that um, my books are idealistic and then I'm positing it that and, and it's idealistic because there's no clean cut um, between the machine and something else. And I'm saying, no, it's, it's the subject that is that cut, right? That's why this, anticipate, this anticipation and retroactive determination is so crucial. Right? We can say, oh yes, it's all just machines doing, you know, doing things. It's all just our setting doing things. And then you have no space for politics, but politics is coming in with this divisive move. Um, and so I, I don't buy this version of, oh, well, you know, that we're not living in Fordist capitalism. Well, neither was Lenin, and neither was Rosa Luxemburg. Right? Lenin was living with a bunch of peasants, well, that's not fair, but it, mm. they were, it, it was, <laughs> most of the revolutionary um, heritage comes not after there's industrial capitalism. So this argument that the economic conditions are, are wrong, I think is really mis a mistake. And I mean, everybody repeats it. And it's just, that's, I think, false. Um, and then on the um, question of the legacy of struggles against the subject, you know, and you use the Paris Commune as an example. And this is a great example. Because I would say that the women who are um, defending um, the tanks, who fraternize with the soldiers in this great way, and so they make the uh, national government have to stand down, they are the opening for what then is retroactively determined as the subject. They are the possibility of the subject. They made it, ha they made it happen, but they didn't determine it. It was retroactively determined, and it could have failed. Right, so, I, and so the struggle then is that you know, we can struggle over which subject will it have been, but they make the opening, and then it becomes retroactively determined. So I think that there to say that there's a legacy of struggles against the subject kind of misses the point, or it misleads the point. And then on big data, I mean, big data is interesting as a material locus of crowds. Right? I agree with you, crowds are not just people. Crowds depend on their material environments. Um, like it's hard to have big crowds in the United States because we've got awful suburbs everywhere. Right? So physical crowds, but we do have crowds online with Twitter. And we have crowds in, you know, around stores. So the physicality, the means, the media, all of that's absolutely crucial. So I'll agree with you on that at one little point. <laughs> Well, um, we have um, come to those uh, very irritating words and concepts that immediately cause I mean, an argument, ideal, human, subject, <laughs> the, the, um, the row is inevitable. Um, nevertheless, um, I would say that yes, definitely, these are the kind of metaphysical and um, unitary uh, concepts on the one hand. On the other hand, maybe we have to reconsider them. And maybe they are not so detached from imminences. Maybe these concepts are, can, can be understood in a nonetheless imminent way than those machinic constellations uh, that are uh, exerted by uh, multiplicities. Um, because this would be really irrational and probably not, not justified to think that ideals are not part and parcel of any move, of compassion, of empathy, of uh, struggle. So they are nonetheless even psychically imminent in certain conditions and in certain uh, imminent constellations. Um, uh, uh, and uh, referring back to this example um, uh, with Danko, yeah, so it's, well, on the one hand, the primitive interpretation would be that, yes, this is a very obsolete hero, Nietzschean, Promethean figure, bringing, uh, sacrificing himself, this is Christian sacrificial model. Uh, but in this case, uh, uh, on 
the one hand, you can understand him as subject, and then this would be a very obsolete figure. But what if his move is granting the others the capacity to construct themselves to become subject? And this is some kind of dedication to the other class. So the problem of contemporary struggle is that it's self-emancipatory and self-referential. It emancipates oneself. Middle class emancipates oneself. The precarious workers emancipate themselves. But what we probably have forgotten from the 19th century is becoming the other class, is certain kind of uh, referring back to uh, to the uh, to the op 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 oppressed and the, the exploited, and not teaching them, but learning from them, and constructing them as subject. And when you construct the other as the subject, and you try to become the other, then subject is not a unitary self-referential uh, construction um, as such. And um, another thing is. Um, uh, is, is the, the, the issue of idea and ideal and ideology uh, and the human. Um, I would say that, um, well, there's a, a, the big discussion of the human and humanism, yeah, that uh, the, the, the Deleuzean and post Deleuzean and post operaist and accelerationist uh, theory had been radically post humanist and transhumanist in terms of. Um, dispersing uh, all those entities into, into creative modes, flows, and uh, uh, capacities. But if we look at the history of philosophy, even, um, uh, a human issue had never been reduced to a human being. A human issue had always been inhuman. And uh, the issue about humanism had been always how a human being can be non-human and more than human and more than individual. And this is human issue. So, um, uh, so for me, the, um, uh, first, uh, there is a very big debate in accelerationism that uh, we have to accelerate capitalism, uh, intensify it to transpose humanity and humanism because Capitalism is too human, it's too middle class, it's uh, not enough advanced in technology, in move, in, um, uh, in invention, etc., etc. So uh, being human is retarded. Uh, and therefore we have to somehow leap away from this, um, from the, uh, from this limited condition. Uh, but um, at the same time, uh, we could say that uh, it is exactly the um, non-individual and uh, radically um, uh, split issue of an individual that constructs uh, human, human or humanist solidarity, even if we refer back to uh, to Renaissance um, times. I will end up here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, this is excellent. Um, so, I mean, part of what's, what's, <laughs> what's coming out uh, here is, first of all, that I, I have a clear um, nostalgia for macho figures of uh, <laughs> the leaders, but but really that I mean. I think although uh, at the same time, my, my my case study is actually about a woman who embodies that. Uh, image this is a well. macho woman. <laughs> uh, but 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 it's true, and and I find this. And but for me, we can kind of easily sort of cast aside this these these images as having some being rooted in in, in uh, uh, you know the Christian tradition and so on. Or, Nietzsche and Superman, or whatever. Um, but uh, what I, I don't know, what I'm interested in is specifically how, having lost the ability to identify with those kind of images, that first, they, they, do, they, they do seem to have gone, right? Uh, uh, that we've lost something and that it hasn't been replaced. And there's a certain kind of lack in our, in our thinking about uh, politics and art as well, uh, where, you know, having, 
maybe we can say, oh, goodbye, I'm happy, you know, I, I don't shed any tears for, for losing this and so on. Um, but at the same time, uh, in, in a lot of uh, circumstances, I think that, that people uh, do sense a, a kind of absence. Um, and so, kind of what, what, I'm, what I'm actually, what I'm interested in a lot, what I'm, what I'm hoping um, to learn more from, from everyone here at this conference is how that, uh, that kind of um, sense of what, what do you have if you don't have a leader, right? What do you have if you don't have heroism? What do you have if you don't have kind of a, a, a conception of the divided subject as someone who um, is able to, um, you know, use their weakness to, 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 to help the, the um, uh, collective subject form itself, as Katie, Katie, Katie was saying, uh, use their division uh, for the benefit of, of uh, uh, the political subject and struggle. Um, so, I mean, the next question I think is probably going to have to be our, our last one, um, considering our pacing, uh, is, is about that as well, and also to do with some of the things Katie was saying about how the artist uh, may be uh, well, not the artist, but how, how the, the, a militant can identify uh, with another class, perhaps with a weaker class, and there's some kind of, of interesting production of, of subjectivity that happens there. Which, but for me, is also specifically related to the question of what can be the emancipatory potential of art. Um, and, and so this is uh, a question about, uh, that can be taken from, from two perspectives. And Jody, in a lot of your work, you've recently you've been talking about uh, what, kind, what could be a political party uh, in the current circumstances. And, and for me, that's, of course, if, we, if we're saying that it's not going to be a Leninist party, then, then that's part of, I think it's part of the same kind of question um, that we've been asking. So something has gone and we have to decide if we're going to replace it with something completely different or, or reconsider it, maybe, as, as Katie was saying. Um, but in art specifically, there's also this, this sense that art, um, people have, have been arguing recently that art is, is fundamentally a middle class activity and therefore cannot have, you know, if, we, if our feeling is that this, the, the, you know, what we would want, once call the proletariat, um, um, or, you know, if we wanted to, to take a, a, a broader sense of, of um, some kind of subject that emerges from the position of oppression within, uh, within society that becomes the, the, the subject of resistance and revolution, uh, that if art is fundamentally a kind of middle class, sort of ancillary to the capitalist class uh, activity, can it, uh, how can, can it break out of that model um, as, you know, people have, have tried um, uh, ever since the avant-garde began to do, um, and maybe back to the Renaissance. Um, or is this something that, uh, you know, art is going to be fundamentally political, art is going to be fundamentally circumscribed by it. It's not going to uh, uh, be able to resolve. Um, so, so I mean, again, I'm uh, trying to put these things, two, two things together in the political situation. What kind of, uh, can we have a, a, a new idea of, of the party? Uh, leader, is that a kind of leadership that we're talking about, the vanguard? Um, and in art, is there some kind of fundamental problem with the avant-garde, the idea of an avant-garde, um, uh, if it's coming from this, this other class, the class that is not um, in the position that we were talking about? So I want to say something about the party rather than the art part. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, first I think the, I th actually think that something like a party is absolutely necessary and that it's, that people are realizing this um, more and more, right? That the left is moving away from the kind of multitude autonomous networks doing their thing and towards um, a recognition that any ability to affect power means that you have to have um, forms of association that do not achieve power, but in fact make um, getting power their goal. And um, I think that the Leninist party was pretty effective doing that. And so rather than throwing out the baby with the bathwater, it's um, a good idea to see um, how it would be even possible to um, make one. Um, in, in some ways, it seems that many on the left, and now I'll just say it in the US con um, context, I don't know if this is here, but people keep saying things like, oh, well, you know, we don't really want to do that. We don't want to take power. It's like, are you kidding me? You can't get more than 30 people to do anything, right? I mean, it's, a, it's, it's there's a way that people make incapacity into some kind of moral position rather than something to be worked on in order to change the situation that we're in. Um, in terms of the exact features 
that a um, militant party would have now, or a Leninist party would have now. I, I think those are the kinds of questions, like there are questions are posed by the movements themselves, but that if we think formally, that we recognize that the, the party functions um, kind of like um, a, 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 an analyst, like a transferential point, um, that is a point against which um, groups or crowds or millions can understand themselves um, or can see their own um, desire reflected back. And so the idea is to think more about what is the form that party um, lets groups accomplish rather than get bogged down in a specific organizational feature or get that bogged down in thinking about um, leaders in, I mean, I actually think that your version of leaders almost seems like it's left over from you know, cults of personality rather than even real existing party practices. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there because I'll probably want to disagree with um, Gerald. It's interesting, I, I would also want to, to answer the art question, but of course the party question is too, 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 too near. Uh, but I, I, I don't disagree in this uh, sense. Uh, I just want to put up certain problems, because I, I, I'm definitely clear that we need, I would call it monster institutions, some form of re-territorializing the sociality on the political level. No, no problem to agree with that. Uh, but when it comes to the, the reality of uh, existing and um, uh, new parties, uh, and there are a lot in Europe at the moment, uh, then you see the, the problems that, uh, that occur. Syriza in Greece, uh, I mean the, the link in, in Germany is not very new. Um, most interesting is the Spanish uh, territory, definitely. Um, and there you can see the problems that you have with all the different uh, new parties there. Um, Podemos, uh, we are uh, in France, as friends we are uh, ironically calling it Pablemos, uh, <laughs> because then you have the, the cult of the leader, even, even, even if the party exists for half a year, it starts with the problem of the cult of the leader. Um, you have, uh, and Podemos is only the, the most visible of these new, new parties in Spain, and you have another problem that uh, colleagues and comrades in, in Spain are really definitely uh, and emotionally discussing at the moment, uh, how to avoid that the party sucks the, the energy of the social yeah, and th there are the interesting problems that one should discuss when it comes to what I would call uh, monster institutions to the, by the way the term is not very serious, it, it just says on the one hand we need something like institutions, on the other hand they should be monstrous in the sense that uh, all of these problems are considered or even exploding. Um, maybe I can pass the mic and say something more about the art question afterwards? Well, um, actually, um, it, it's, the, it's the issue of class, right? The, the party is the issue of uh, class for itself. Uh, and the, the, the problem or why party was considered to be a despotic apparatus was that it wasn't functioning because it couldn't refer to, to a monolithic class on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, the issue was that working class uh, in, in many political theories uh, after operaism was not constructing the political struggle. And uh, we know that the issue was always the liberation of cognitive power, because cognitive power is enabling um, an advance, technological advance, advance of um, uh, productive forces, etc., etc. Um, uh, nevertheless, um, for me, the problem here is not so much in claiming the party, but rather 
uh, in in the gap or and in the um, in the level of advancement of those who claim emancipation, who claims it and in favor of whom, right? So the working class party was actually uh, some kind of apparatus that would take responsibility again as, as this Danko for the others and that would emancipate them. So this was some kind of uh, drawing uh, certain, I don't know, people who were completely stuck into their um, retarded context out or out, politically out, economically out, productively, etc., etc. So, um, uh, in case of cognitive uh, um, multiplicities becoming this uh, force, uh, uh, how does it function? Uh, who is taking responsibility for this uh, gap? Uh, even if we take this belief of Negri into radical technological acceleration when uh, cognitive power has to be appropriated from a capital. But how and who? And those who do not uh, own this cognitive power, what happens with them? So, so for me the issue here is how this uh, gap and inequality in cognitive uh, forces uh, can be applied and can be treated. Uh, and this is, I think, the most unsurmountable uh, yeah, problem and issue. May I just uh, yeah. say one sentence or two? Uh, because I have to clarify the, the thing with the acceleration, because this, it sounds like that uh, Tony Negri becomes Baudrillard, uh, <laughs> so he's not. Uh, and this uh, also refers to something which uh, I think was uh, said before, not only to your hinting to, to Negri. The idea of, uh, or the, the positive part, for me, positive part of what is called here acceleration, which is, from my point of view, not acceleration, but affirm affirmation, uh, means affirmation, affirming the components of the actual modes of production that could be switched into a revolutionary practice. Uh, not, not just accelerating uh, uh, the actual way of capitalism and hoping that at some point it, uh, it breaks down. That's really ridiculous. Uh, uh, so there is the difference between Baudrillard and Deleuze, uh, I would say, in this uh, sense between acceleration and uh, affirmation. And I, I don't know where Tony Negri is there. Accelerating. On the um, affirmation view, I would say that even if that, that that's possible, and I think it makes sense to think that there are some aspects of current economies that can be useful and that others that cannot be, it doesn't erase the um, necessity of a political moment or a political change. Right, the, the difference in what, uh, what the mode of production is doing. And I think that the, one of the problems in both the affirmationist view and the accelerationist view is this is basically a kind of continuation of capitalist desubjectification that continues to um, try to push back or avoid or eliminate the, political, um, the fact of politics or the political moment. And then um, Kenti, when you were talking about you know, the party would emancipate them, I, even, you know, even though there would be some people who would have said that, I would say that it, mess, it misses the point that the, that the party is just a form by which, through which people emancipate themselves. And, so, and, and that that's the usefulness of it, right? It's the way that people become politically powerful and can feel themselves as a political collectivity. If not, then you're just a bunch of scattered individuals, right? Left to whether or not you're rich. Potatoes. Potatoes. Mm. Do you want to bring the heart? <laughs> if there is time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so. Um, uh, always, if, 
it comes to these um, rather simplifying attacks on art as being middle class, which is partially right, but uh, also spills out a bit too much of the child. It reminds me, um, for instance, of, of the um, strategy of, of Claire Bishop when uh, a person who is, is known, known in the art field, maybe not in the theory uh, political fields, but um, uh, who, who became a bit famous uh, by repeating something which, uh, uh, for instance, German, German discourses around Springering uh, said to, ten years before uh, even, uh, uh, and what they said is criticizing harshly uh, the turn to re re relationality and to something which is sometimes called othering, uh, to producing the other uh, working with communities, with uh, outsiders, uh, and so on. Uh, and that's, uh, that's something which um, cannot be solved in a way, because uh, if I have an artistic or whatever project, if I start, even as a collective, start something, then there is definitely an outside. Uh, and I can't get rid of this problem. I can only self-critically manage it. You know, uh, and this is my important, um, or my, for me, uh, it's important to say uh, that you also should not, not you, but uh, one should not judge uh, on this, um, on this uh, argument uh, again, universal general level, but look at the project themselves, each, each of them, and where are the problems of othering? Uh, where are the problems uh, um, of didactic, pe pedagogic uh, um, um, positions uh, and where are the positive aspects of that? And, and there I would say, um, I, uh, in the last years I became uh, maybe uh, sometimes a bit together, sometimes a bit against uh, the comrades of uh, Trovella uh, uh, became interested in Brechtian aspects, in, uh, in also certain aspects of didactics. Uh, um, again, self-critically knowing that you can't get rid of this uh, inside-outside uh, and sometimes also hierarchical position. Well, I, I, I think this art uh, issue I would maybe develop tomorrow during the talk, uh, when I will dwell on on the possible return to sensuous involvement as against dispersing in externality, externality of of, of capital and, the, and in its conditions. Awesome. Um, as I mentioned, um, or as Jonathan mentioned, I'm not an art person really. I'm a political theorist. But as I've been um, working with a group in Brooklyn and also trying to read things um, um, to prepare for this, I started getting uh, this kind of sense that it seems like, like in the absence of, of you know, an organized political left, like I would want to call it the party, that, that um, art, particularly socially engaged art, gets um, basically uh, gets cloaked in or described in terms that were, would have been um, previously attached to an actual party. So that the um, artist or the art project, particularly socially engaged art project, um, takes on the role of organizer. And um, the, um, in fact, there's a, a recent article about um, artists in Occupy Wall Street where the um, author, um, Nancy McKee, was talking about artists as organizer as a particular kind of, of moment in, um, in, you know, in the activist art in New York. And, um, and so there's an organizing role. Then there's also the kind of didactic or pedagogic role that the artist takes on. And then the, there's some role of kind of enlightening um, the, um, the oppressed or letting the oppressed come to some kind of new kind of consciousness. And that strikes me as an incredibly burdensome 
for single collectives, not to mention individuals, to invest in them all of the kinds of political aspirations previously carried by uh, national and international organizations um, seems um, not useful. Um, I, I would refer to some of my students who very much uh, lately became attached to this notion of Partienists is Kustva. Part, uh, Partisanship. Party. Partisanship in art. Party, party mindedness of art. Uh, and uh, they um, somehow justify this issue by the fact that art is able to to be constructive, it can somehow get rid of uh, aesthetic issues and the communist art, and if you refer back to what Platonov was writing, how art is getting rid of this uh, objectia in need of something interested, and even this issue of astranenia, so this is some kind of stage of art, and comes uh, to this um, well, you said non-alienation is not possible, but you know this uh, consecutive work with de-alienating existence. And uh, when, when I re uh, and I understand them, uh, and they refer to socialist realism, they refer to Soviet film, uh, and uh, immediately there comes the issue like, oh, this party mindedness was ideological. And then <laughs> there comes to mind also some humanism is ideological. Yes, it is ideological. So what? <laughs> uh, um, uh, ideologicalness can be understood in maybe different modes. And that's why I was meaning maybe we can reconsider it. Ideology uh, and even a socialist realism can be seen as a complete gap. So there is something imposed and absolutely alien and not understood and comprehensible for what is exerted from below. And there is a uh, certain exertion of certain mood uh, in, in the name of a certain goal. And then this can also be ideological in terms like you, you, and you, and you have to accomplish this and this and this. And we believe that this could have been possible. And um, uh, uh, this goal is not based on desire, but on necessity. So, uh, maybe this is this, this, is this point uh, that refers back to socialist um, uh, uh, experience of art, uh, not only desire, aesthetically desiring and sexually desiring, libidinally desiring, but understanding of necessity. Yeah, uh, and um, very often when I was, for instance, showing some uh, examples of Soviet films, uh, being amazed how the issue of ethics works there and how aesthetics is becoming uh, the backstage in comparison with ethical issues, uh, my uh, my colleagues from Humboldt from Freie University were saying, "But come on, this is ideology," and then my students told me. And why not? Ethics is about ideology. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, I think we have maybe half hour or 45 minutes for questions. You out there? Any questions? Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'm. Uh, I uh, struggling a little bit still with this idea um, of the significance of the crowd, or I'd rather say maybe the mass. Um, there was a phrase that emerged, I think, from Tucker Square um, that accompanied this pamphlet. It was an illustrated guide about how to uh, resist on a day-to-day -day basis, probably numbers of you have seen it. And um, there was this phrase that emerged from it, the intelligence of the mass. And um, I, I think there's something really different and significant that has happened. I'm not sure if it's so crucial about marking a beginning, but in the movements of the squares, um, this um, uh, 
coexistence of many different uh, groupings of people with many different interests who figured out a way to live for a certain kind of duration. Could have been a couple of months, in some cases it was more than a year. Um, and there's something um, that I think is still under theorized about the political significance of that kind of um, intelligence of the mass, of a kind of consciousness. And it, uh, uh, maybe in the period that we are now, I think there's something else that's under theorized, which is um, perhaps described as political depression. That um, the kinds of, um, uh, and maybe this can be traced back to the international movements against the war in Iraq, Bush's war in Iraq, where the, uh, it seemed to some that despite millions and millions of people in every city across the globe, that collectively this mass was not able to stop the inexorable um, march of, of war. Um, but there's, it, it, there seems to be um, some lessons that need to be drawn that have to do maybe with looking at questions of political effectiveness and what, uh, so what is it that's going to sustain um, the desire of uh, movements of these multitudes to keep on given that defeats are real? Um, death, imprisonment, exhaustion, and so on. On the, um, I think on the question of what sustains movement, um, you know, that, that's always hard, right? If, this, if that was the kind of thing that any one person could answer, we would, it wouldn't even be a, a real question, right? It's something that um, all political movements have to, um, have to encounter. I think that um, in the contemporary setting, the internet world and you know, extreme communicative capitalism gives people a sense of political change is something that happens quickly. Um, and people, ex um, at least I'm thinking now primarily in the US, there's a sense that, that things matter very quickly, that you have to respond to a 24-7 um, media cycle, and I think that folks who are critical of spectacle are attuned to that, um, that the following um, different um, kind of global events, whether or not it's a, um, a summit or a biennial that critiques of those also bring up the kind of problems of the sporadic um, approach to movement politics. So I think one, one of the ways that we deal with that is recognizing um, different temporalities of political movement. And I actually think that something like a party is crucial because a party is an organization that persists even as movements ebb and fall. So if a movement's gonna have to have a lot of um, spontaneous energy with it, parties have a longer, um, a longer view. Right, and they're, they are, um, tend to be people who recognize that, okay, I'm gonna have to make a long-term commitment here, that I may not be, um, you know, not the same folks who are gonna come out for a big demonstration now, or even a three-month demonstration, but a longer haul. So I think at least one way to think about the problems of sustaining movements is with a different kind of temporality, one that's not given in terms of the immediacy of a media cycle or um, the sense that political change happens um, you know, quickly within a, a week, a month, a year. I think um, actually Gerald's discussion of the different um, modalities of revolution also attends to that, the different kinds of, 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 of time frames. For me, to put it blunt, uh, the, the efficiency question is rather a question of the mass media. Like the same, uh, not the same, the, the same problem, uh, the, another question of the mass media to the social movement is what would you or what do you demand? And I think it's quite famous that in the, uh, the diverse Occupy movements, uh, people became clear about that they do not demand anything too 
certain uh, institutions like the media, like the state, and, and so on. So um, I would prefer um, to to not put the question even. Uh, and if I'm interested in um, the traces of uh, I would not call it effects, but the traces of social movements, uh, I would, for instance, look at um, Egypt in a different way you did uh, in, the, in, the, in the layout here. Um, I don't know who knows what uh, transformations of uh, modes of subjectivation happened in Egypt in the last four years. Who knows? Uh, I, I'm not the one who, to judge. Uh, on the macro-political molar level, we know what happened. Uh, but on the level of, uh, for, for instance, the daily life of females in, in, in Cairo, uh, I will not judge it. I, I would really uh, talk to people there and, and, and not uh, on the, the mass media level, uh, uh, which is spectacular again with its uh, questions and answers. Thank you very much for all that stuff, um, for a really inspiring discussion. I just have a very short question to the party. So do you see the party as something within a nation state or on a planetary level or transnational? Um, so I, I, I find it very inspiring to think about the party again. So I would like to know more concretely how you see that. And I think, uh, coming back to the temporalities, um, do you see people who actually have the time um, to invest themselves and their bodies and their labor and their intellect into this party making? Uh, thanks for the question. I think um, in, in my head, right, my, my students call this Joey's imaginary party, but <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Uh, it, it, it has to be international. And the thing is, is that we have already, from the standpoint of the, um, the global anti-capitalist movement, those we can think of those as, as steps, um, as ways that people are actually, um, you know, have been actually pulling together across national boundaries. Also, considering that um, so, like on a kind of technical legal um, uh, dimension. Um, people may recall this in Bolivia or Argentina, they pass laws um, against some um, bad guy water um, privatizers. But then in the international courts and in the international adjudication, that was overturned. It's like, oh, you can't do that, you're hurting transnational business. So, which is a kind of, for me, a very concrete example of why um, inter some version of an international party is crucial. I mean, this was Marx's original idea you know, um, back with the um, International um, Union of Working Men or International Labor um, Organization. And, and I think the best of the Communist Party had an international focus, even if its international realization um, you know, left something to be desired. So I think it has to be um, understood and, um, internationally as we imagine it. Um, now, um, and as we actually, as we realize it and see the ways that people are already realizing it. Now, who has time for this? Well, artists. <laughs> um, I think that in fact, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, <it's not> <laughs> <laughs> Should be artists part. Yeah, artists. <laughs> It's a good uh, countering the essentializing of the artist's function. The guys and the women who have nothing to do with it. <laughs> so, so they form the party. Uh, thank you. I would like to ask you about art and uh, ideology. If I understood you right, I believe that uh, the ideological function of art should be put ahead of some pathetic detail for other functions. Uh, so if this is true, uh, does it mean that any art that satisfies some political power should be considered more meaningful? 
than other forms of art, and who's going to judge the art itself in that case? Thank you. A wonderful question. Um, well, actually, you reconstructed now the logic of um, split between uh, aesthetic, creative, imminent uh, values and merits of art and uh, some kind of uh, alien uh, imposed um, institutional forces who are um, forcing art into certain limits or certain political instrumentalized uh, themes. Something that happened definitely in socialist realism in its worst sense something that happened in totalitarian uh, cultures and totalitarian societies in its worst sense and this culture and this art is definitely absolutely empty and uh, uninteresting. Uh, what I mean here is that um, is more like what Hegel means by art. I mean, Hegel's aesthetics had never been Kantian aesthetics. It has never been about perception. It has never been about beauty. It has ever been about idea, but idea had never been something that would have been split from uh, constructing imminences. I mean, even if you take the post classical uh, artistic procedures in Romanticism, the issue of the sublime, the issue of the idea, and the involvement into production uh, was actually something that went hand in hand, uh, that went together. Therefore, I would say that um, there is this uh, uh, aestheticized uh, uh, argument between uh, Badiou and Rancière. You probably very well know about it, uh, the argument. Badiou uh, insisting that idea is preliminary and idea is initial for art. Uh, whatever happens in art, whether it's dance, whether it's poetry, whether it's uh, literature or uh, visual art, whereas um, um, uh, Rancière uh, insists that it's a play, it's an aesthetic immanence that evolves out of the matter. Uh, and, well, I, I don't think that there is any resolution here, because uh, mm, uh, because you can say that the immanence is uh, the idea of art. On the other hand, you can say that aesthetics never matters for, for the person who produces it. Well, I, I mean, a, a revolutionary poet who would be maybe inspired by a certain issue or the topic, what comes first? His methodology of aesthetic devices or his striving for a certain goal or idea. I mean, I wouldn't... It's a very complicated issue, it needs, needs discussion, but I wouldn't say, I wouldn't differentiate here uh, the good aesthetic uh, methodology, although in art this happened, these things became split, right? The cognitive and the sensuous, the cognitive and sensitive issues in art got split completely. Uh, but the, the, this is this is the issue that has to be reconsidered in um, in, in, artist, in artistic practice. Maybe I, I guess it's a question for for Johnny again. Um, well, I think that perhaps we could agree that art always, or at least. I think many of us here share the opinion that art needs to respond to certain urgencies, that it recognizes with the specific uh, tools and its specific kind of uh, sensorial capacity, a certain political or societal urgency, and then um, reacts to it or poses additional questions and complicates those already existing constellations. So in, in the scenario that you um, delineate, I guess, it somehow, um, the question is, if you believe that the party is that kind of a political formation that can be a potential answer to the post-politics for which we also lack aesthetics, I guess, um, what is then 
the case for art after the formation of the party, let's say after the revolution to the party uh, formation actually succeeds? I, I can't answer that. Um, I, I, but let me tell you why I don't think we should ask it. Um, at least in, in, uh, in, the, in, in the US, um, in my sense, also in, um, in the UK and Canada, so I'm just saying places where I'm quite familiar, um, the possibility of a communist party um, exerting political influence at this point is very low. And so it seems to me to be defeatist to worry about what do we do after we win. I think we should worry about how we win, not what do we do afterwards. Um, some people might think that's a little dangerous, but I think that um, as I, I, I believe that we make the movement as we are um, carrying it out, as we're fighting for it, and that our um, ideals and associations change as we do that, and that that's good. And so that I just got it because I was thinking about the Occupy movement in, in New York. Uh, I mean, at a certain point, sometimes maybe it's uh, useful to um, to use the spaces or the resources uh, of the institutions in your own tiny art field or, or whatever. But uh, I think the idea of Yates McGee that I didn't read, uh, read the text, but uh, the idea of artists as a part of or a certain uh, function, having a certain function of organizing uh, is, is more interesting for me than, uh, than the idea of occupying museums. Uh, why do I say that? Because I think uh, museums are interesting on the level of institutional critique, but there my demand is to the, the directors, uh, curators and other museum persons to reform themselves in a radical way. They should not need an outside occupying themselves. Uh, but for me, it's clear in the last five, six years of crisis that everyone, also the directors of art museums, should have uh, experienced that there is a problem and that they are, uh, yeah, maybe um, also responsible in their institutional situation. So. My idea is more uh, that museums are interested, interesting, but not uh, as a place to occupy. Uh, I have a short follow-up. I think that the true revolution should have as a goal to have the good art uh, produced and shown to the people, and not vice versa. And that's the only goal there is. <laughs> <laughs> If we are doing avant-garde, so what you are, as all saying, doesn't have anything to do with avant-garde. Avant-garde is about the victory of art. The victory of art over what? Over everything else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a very bourgeois idea about avant-garde. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's interesting because this actually, it might be an opportunity to get, get a little bit deeper into this for one last second. Because, I mean, there is something bourgeois in the artist, you know, the, the artist's desire. There is a, a, an impulse to power and to self-realization uh, in yeah, artistic but, um, practice. Maybe what Artem meant uh, was the following, that uh, uh, avant-garde tended to sublate um, to sublate art and dissolve into life, but on the other hand, it constructed life as something incessantly artistic, which was kind of hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, but we still have the problem of, of good art. Yeah, I'm not so much interested in this question, uh, but uh, maybe to, to connect the question of organizing and uh, Artyom's uh, comment. Uh, I would not, I, I, I am not so patient to wait for the revolution, whatever that means. So uh, I think, uh, but I'm, I'm preaching to the converted. There are people in the room that do it like this. Uh, organizing, 
in very different ways. Uh, sometimes it's more formal, formalist organizing, sometimes it's more content related, but uh, I think this ha has to be done here and now and not uh, in, the, uh, in the future. All right, so let's thank Eric. Uh,